Welcome everybody to uh, the latest instalment of these uh, teaching sessions from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. My name is Giles Bond-Smith. I'm one of the clinical leads uh, for emergency surgery and HPV surgery in, in, uh, in Oxford University. Um, Hospitals Trust, also the um, RSA um, in the Oxford region. I am so pleased to introduce um, today Mr. Tacker, um, who's um, a consultant HPB surgeon at the University um, Hospital of Southampton, NHS Trust. He's also the RSA for Wessex for the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and an honorary senior lecturer at the uh, Southampton Medical School. Um, just before we kick off to point out that uh, the next lecture after this one is the acute limb ischemia um, on the 21st of April, then there's also next Thursday, a lecture on dysphagia. More details to come at the end of this, but for now, I'll hand you over to um, Mr. Tacker. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to try within about 20, 25 minutes, go through the management of uh, gallstone disease. Um, I would hope that we would go through a number of objectives and across the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, we'll talk about common types of gallstones, identify symptoms that go with, you know, with gallstone disease, talk about the anatomy and pathophysiology of the condition, differential diagnoses, complications, and management of the condition itself, as well as a brief, brief look at the NICE guidelines, uh, which are the nationally mandated guidelines for the management of gallstones. Uh, and we're going to start. We're going to start off with definitions. This is something I talk to my medical students about, and effectively try and get them to differentiate between cholelithiasis, which is the presence of gallstones in the gallbladder, as well as cholelithiasis, where the doco bit means the bile duct or the biliary tree, and that's the, the presence of gallstones within the biliary tree. Coming on to epidemiology, well, a large proportion of the population actually have gallstones, and we estimate that this is somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of the population. Uh, when you guys qualify, or those of you who are junior doctors, will find that there will be quite a lot of, of referrals to specialist teams where there's been an incidental pickup of gallstones. And the main question that gets asked is what to do about it. Well, most patients, as seen in the next bit, are asymptomatic. And the truth is you can leave these well alone with no deleterious effects. Incidence increases with age and we see more gallstone disease over the age of 40. It is more common in females than male, males. Uh, there's considerable geographic variation. So for example, in South American countries in the Andes, there is a very, very high proportion uh, of patients with gallstone disease. Uh, whereas in certain other sort of areas, including some parts of Northern Europe and Asia, you see less. And that's to do with uh, complex environmental factors. Uh, it is one of the, if not the most common GI cause for hospital admission, uh, especially in the UK. And even in this time of COVID-19, we are seeing patients with complex and simple gallstone disease presentations. Looking at the anatomy, well, uh, hopefully you'd all know that uh, it, uh, the gallbladder lives under the right upper quadrant, uh, uh, and that's the site of where patients complain of pain. And if you look at anatomy itself, the gallbladder is divided into the body, the fundus, and the neck. Uh, gallstones sit within, uh, within the body of the gallbladder and then can get Im impacted in the neck uh, and the cystic duct, which is the duct that connects the gallbladder to the common hepatic duct. That's the site of the problem, and uh, if there is persistent obstruction of the neck of the gallbladder by stones, then you can get mucus formation proximally, which then leads to inflammation and thickening of the gallbladder wall, and subsequently acute cholecystitis. And of course, if stones slip through down the neck into the common bile duct, you can of course have a patient presenting with jaundice, or more dangerously with cholangitis, which is infection of the bile duct itself. Looking at the stones themselves, that's what commonly a gallbladder that's been opened up looks like. Most of these uh, tend to be a mixture uh, of cholesterol uh, and calcium. They can also be pigmented stones uh, with a combination of, cal of calcium bilirubinate and mucin glycoproteins. Uh, these are specifically the black stones are associated with hemoly hemolytic conditions. Uh, brown stones, which are commonly seen in the Asian population, are associated with infections and parasites, which, uh, of course, uh, uh, you don't really see that much in the UK. Uh, 
uh, but these are more commonly found in the biliary tree. Risk factors, well, age we've already mentioned, gender we've already mentioned, and pregnancy. Uh, so uh, it, it is reasonably common. In fact, uh, I've just had a telephone consultation with a pregnant lady uh, who's got biliary colic. Uh, in her case, we're going to wait for her, uh, her to deliver her baby in two months' time uh, and then take out her gallbladder. But also uh, sort of ethnicity, so North America and Europe, dietary factors such as obesity with a diet high in fats and, and cholesterols. And interestingly, in, uh, there is an association with rapid weight loss. And this is something that's come about after gastric bypass surgery or obesity surgery, where these patients lose weight very quickly. Uh, they then uh, look, look like that there is a preponderance of patients ending up with a high uh, incidence of gallstone disease. There's also a genetic predisposition, which could be related to a number of factors which I have listed there, but the ones to think about are cystic fibrosis, uh, as well as hemolytic anemias or hemolytic disease, such as ferrocytosis, sickle cell disease, and the porphyrias. Drugs which possibly could be associated uh, uh, with gallstones uh, include total parenteral nutrition. This is feeding patients uh, via intravenous access happens uh, reasonably frequently in UK hospitals uh, and can uh, lead to gallstones. But also, if you're on optratide, which is uh, a drug uh, used in carcinoid disease uh, and also uh, a drug that's used uh, in patients who have pancreatic fistulae, uh, that uh, can lead to the formation of, uh, of gallstones. But also, so other drugs such as fibrates, uh, potentially uh, PPIs, Orlistat, which is a weight loss drug, as well as thiazide diuretics. Uh, statins, supposedly, along with ursodeoxycholic acid, uh, may decrease the risk of stone formation. Now, this is something that we see our hepatology colleagues, uh, if patients have gallstone disease and are potentially unfit to undergo uh, actual operative intervention, uh, they get put onto ursodeoxycholic acid. But between uh, you and me, uh, as surgeons, we're not entirely convinced that uh, that this particularly helps uh, uh, get rid of stones or indeed um, with symptoms either. Uh, so what the textbooks say, well, it's the classic five Fs, female, fertile, fat, fair, and 40. This is not quite true in, in the modern era. And that's because we think environmental factors, especially in, in developed countries, such as having a universal diet that's high in cholesterol, uh, sort of et cetera, uh, has led to a high incidence in, uh, in gallstone disease. And just anecdotally, uh, the youngest person I've taken a gallbladder out of uh, was, uh, was 11 years old uh, um, and had a weight of 78 kilograms. Uh, 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 and the oldest person I've taken a gallbladder out of was, you know, was 91. So not 100% that the five Fs now hold true, but, but yes, it, it's, a, it's something to bear in mind. Uh, and obesity... Uh, so, as I said, it is one of the, the major factors here. Incidence, well, as we said, most patients are asymptomatic, so frequently scans are being done for something else when gallstones are found. Our normal answer to this question when we get asked and get rung up about this is do nothing as long as the patient is asymptomatic. Uh, two to four percent of these patients uh, will then develop symptoms each year. And once symptomatic, patients do tend to have recurrent um, you know, sort of problems. And what I tell my patients who are reasonably reluctant to have operations is that uh, they could leave my clinic room uh, and not have pain uh, sort of ever again, uh, but also that they could leave, leave the clinic and then be um, well sort of admitted to hospital uh, within the next 24 hours because the pain comes back. And that is the unpredictable nature that, that, you know, once you're symptomatic and have a regular pattern of symptoms, it is quite difficult to say to you that, uh, that this won't go away without active management. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, so uh, how do you diagnose them? Well, uh, mainly done through sort of ultrasound scanning. And here's a, a picture of an ultrasonogram. Uh, you can see that the abdominal wall is labeled there, the pericolic cystic fact, which is the fat that's, that surrounds the gallbladder. You can see the, uh, uh, the sort of reflection of the liver the gallbladder wall itself, and then sludge, which is effectively like sand and grit, but stones as well, which then typically cause that acoustic shadowing, which is uh, shown at the bottom of the image there. 
uh, they can then go on and have x-rays. And, and um, I think uh, the general uh, uh, feeling is that about 10% of, of gallstones are radiolucent and 90% of renal stones are radiolucent. So, so not that, that commonly seen. Uh, you can also see them on CT, uh, but you will find that uh, uh, that sort of asking for a CT scan to look for gallstones will immediately get you pushback from your local radiologist who will tell you that the best modality for diagnosing them is ultrasound scan. So even though you might have a patient who comes in with gallstone pancreatitis and has had a CT, if you can't see stones on that scan and you have a high degree of suspicion, we do send these patients off to have an ultrasound to confirm that diagnosis. Uh, and that's an MRI or MRCP, which again shows shadowing, filling defect within the gallbladder, uh, which uh, hopefully the arrow here you can see uh, uh, shows gallstones. Presentation, biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, gallstone pancreatitis. So let's talk about biliary colic uh, very briefly. Colic is that very typical waxing and waning pain. And this is the thing that, uh, you know, this is what patients complain about when there's a gallstone stuck in the neck of the gallbladder, the gallbladder squeezing against the stone. And that's typically what patients will complain of. Pain comes and goes, comes and goes. If it then becomes constant and the patient has symptoms uh, of sort of constitutional, uh, well, sort of upset, such as fever, um, um, pain that is, you know, sort of that is constant, uh, then you can classify it as acute cholecystitis, that there's a genuine established infection within the gallbladder. And of course, you can have a stone that slips out of the gallbladder through, th uh, through the neck down into the common bile duct, briefly can obstruct the pancreatic duct and then cause gallstone pancreatitis. Uh, you could also have cholecystitis, so stones in the common bile duct, which can cause jaundice, uh, but also more importantly, cholangitis, where you have infection of the bile duct and indeed of the biliary tree. Because the surface area is so large within the biliary tree itself, uh, you get quite a mass bacterial translocation. And these patients, unfortunately, can become ill very, very quickly and need organ support. So it's really quite important that this is picked up well in time. You can also have gallstone ileus, which is where a large stone can slip out uh, into the small bowel and effectively cause symptoms of small bowel obstruction. And I've got a slide later on that shows you a very typical gallstone ileus. And at the end, chronic inflammation due to gallstone disease within a gallbladder can potentially cause gallbladder cancer. And, uh, uh, you know, sort of like I said, in some South American countries where there's a very high incidence of gallstone disease, we also see a very high incidence of gallbladder cancer. So if you have someone who's got gallstone disease and presents with those, with, with, uh, with those symptoms uh, and signs that we've mentioned before, you need to think about a potential differential diagnosis uh, which would include uh, pancreatitis, as I mentioned before, but also all these conditions that I'm highlighting here. So uh, you need to have a think about those. We'll talk about investigations and how you would go about refining uh, your initial observations, but you should also have an open mind uh, that it might be that there's a typical presentation for gallstone disease, but the patient may well have another condition. Things that I tell my own team to watch out for are a myocardial infarction, especially uh, in patients who uh, uh, have diabetes because the symptoms could be atypical. Pneumonias, so every uh, few months we will have a, uh, a small number of patients who will go to uh, sort of accident and emergency and, and be labeled as having biliary colic or acute cholecystitis, but actually have right lower lobe pneumonia and end up in the acute medical unit and vice versa, where we have patients that get sent to us uh, you know, with, uh, uh, with potentially pneumonia, but actually they have, uh, 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 they have acute uh, uh, sort of gallstone disease. Uh, the recolic, so like I said, uh, very typically the, uh, the patient will have epigastric or right upper quadrant pain after a fatty meal. Symptoms tend to be transient and can last anything from 30 minutes to two hours, but in fact can last longer than that. Pain can be mild to excruciating and classically has that waxing and waning characteristic. Uh, patients will sometimes complain of nausea and vomiting uh, and will typically tell you in clinic that they will eat fatty foods, cream cheese, that sort of stuff, fried stuff, uh, which will then lead to their symptoms coming on. Frequently, patients will have food aversion to particular foods that will bring on their symptoms 
uh, you know, effectively because over the last six to eight months or longer, uh, they've worked out that their symptoms uh, are quite severe if they eat those particular foods. Patients will sometimes complain of a metallic taste and bloating. Uh, this is uh, sophocodiodocolithiasis. This is stones in the bittery tree, and hopefully my mouse pointer will... Can, can you see my mouse, point, mouse pointer, Giles? Uh, okay, uh, uh, so that stone's in the cone bile duct, and again, that's a sequelae uh, of uh, uh, stones in the, in the wall bladder. A reasonably high proportion of, uh, of patients who've got symptomatic gallstone disease end up uh, with stones in the common bile duct, but most cases are asymptomatic, and again, this might well be an incidental finding for a scan that's done for some other cause. But if these patients have deranged LFTs and jaundice, uh, uh, then, of course, they, are, uh, they need intervention by means of an ERCP and stone removal and stenting, but also that uh, they end up with pancreatitis and cholangitis when the biliary tree is obstructed and the obstructed bile then gets infected. Like I said, uh, they might need an ERCP uh, or exploration of the common bile duct. Uh, cholangitis, as mentioned previously, acute inflammation and infection within the biliary tree itself this could be due to an increased pressure in the bile duct, which is due to the stones that are obstructing it. As I said before, because of the massive bacterial translocation that takes place, the patient gets, uh, goes into septic shock uh, uh, with uh, a, a very acute response, which then uh, can potentially result in mortality. And hence, we teach our junior team to be vigilant for cholangitis, but also to institute treatment very, very quickly if they if they, you know, if they actually suspect patients having this. And that includes uh, intravenous resuscitation following the ABCs, uh, but also the institution of uh, broad range intravenous antibiotics. Frequently, these patients will need to be moved to intensive care for organ support. So as mentioned before, uh, they need to be, uh, uh, you know, have resuscitation plus antibiotics plus ERCP when they are stabilized. Uh, Symptoms, well, Raynaud's Pentad and Charcot's Dryad, as mentioned before, but all of these include right upper quadrant pain with fever and rigors and jaundice, uh, but also that they have constitutional upset uh, with signs of septic shock. Acute cholecystitis, as mentioned before, uh, these patients, so rather than having biliary colic, which is a waxing and waning pain that gets better of its own accord and resolves spontaneously, these patients will have persistent epigastric and right upper quadrant pain, can sometimes be febrile with chills, nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, and as mentioned before, uh, is due to a stone potentially blocking the neck of the gallbladder. So here we go, that's, the, that's what we think leads to all of those, so I'll just go back to that. So stone blocks the gallbladder or the cystic duct, pressure increases in the gallbladder, leads to edema and inflammation, venous ischemia, formation of mucus and empyema or pus can lead to, if not treated in time with antibiotics, to necrosis, potentially perforation and fistulation. Organisms, well, E. coli, most common, but also a reasonable number of, of cases will have Klebsiella and Pseudomonas, uh, Clostridium, Staph, and Salmonella less so, but also uh, have been known to be isolated from cultures. Well, uh, you would do an examination uh, yeah, uh, when this patient comes onto your acute surgical unit. As I sort of mentioned, that you will find the symptoms uh, of persistent pain with signs of constitutional upset. You then send off, uh, you would examine them and find that they were tender in the right upper quadrant. Uh, uh, you would then make sure that uh, you followed your ABCs and resuscitated your patient, potentially uh, give them intravenous fluids. Uh, but also when you do send off some bloods, you'll find that they have raised inflammatory markers in the form of white cell count and CRP, potentially have deranged, uh, have deranged LFTs. Normally, if you've got acute cholecystitis, your bilirubin will go up a little bit. Uh, if it's gone up very uh, quite high, it's two or three times normal, you should suspect a stone in the common bile duct but normally what you would see is that the ALT will go up and potentially their alkaline foster taste. Uh, you, you would send them off to have an ultrasound scan. And like I said, if you suspect a stone in the common bile duct, uh, you could potentially send them for an MRCP. If you've got a good sonographer, they will normally be able to tell you that there's a stone in the common bile duct simply by doing an ultrasound scan. CT, in case the patient comes in quite unwell, and especially 
if the patient comes in unwell with pancreatitis, because of course uh, this would show you know this would show you uh, effectively um, sort of issues with uh, with the gallbladder, but also the pancreas. So Murphy's sign. Uh, this is what I said when you palpate the costal margin in the right upper quadrant and ask the patient to take a deep breath. Uh, it elicits pain, and that's something that you know most medical students would read up in their textbooks about and say that they are Mur you know Murphy's positive that it is effectively pointing you to the fact that this patient potentially uh, has uh, acute cholecystitis. Uh, looking at uh, the gallbladder images, uh, well, if you look here, uh, both of these, you can see that there's a thickened wall of the gallbladder and uh, on the CT is really quite obvious. You can see a stone there, but also you can see quite a marked edema uh, and thickness of the gallbladder wall, typical for acute cholecystitis. Gangrenous cholecystitis, effectively, I'll show you the CT image as well. Uh, here, uh, this has been left untreated for so whatever reason, so it could be late presentation or that the team were trying to treat the patient with antibiotics. Uh, and what you find then is that there's gas that's formed in the gallbladder wall. So uh, this is uh, a sign that the patient needs treatment, potentially surgical intervention or a drain uh, quite quickly. Uh, gallstone ileus, as mentioned before, you can see just a faint image of possibly a bit of air from where the gallbladder has left the, uh, the, the gallstone has left the gallbladder up in the right of a quadrant. The stone is now sitting in the small bowel, and you can see loops of dilated small bowel centrally, which would fit in with signs of acute small bowel obstruction. But this is an ileus, so bowel not really working or peristalsing, secondary to a large gallstone sitting in there. Don't see this very common in, uh, in Western countries nowadays, but occasionally you will find patients with this. And there, there you go. So same patient, C CT scan, there's a bit of air, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, a sign of a fistula, so an abnormal connection between two uh, sort of epithelial line surfaces. And what's happened is the gallstone has slipped out, fistulated through the gallbladder wall. That's why there's air there gone into the duodenum and then finally made its way into the small bowel and then caused a gallstone ileus. So quite a nice picture there uh, of a CAT scan. Uh, Acalcus cholecystitis um, can happen. Uh, so inflammation in the gallbladder, but no evidence of stones. Uh, can happen in roughly about 5 to 10% of cases. Typically happens in critically ill patients who are immunocompromised. Generally can happen after surgery, but also a reasonably common, uh, commonly seen in patients who've had major trauma or burns or chemotherapy. So, so uh, you know, in the immunocompromised population, uh, tends to potentially have a high morbidity and mortality. So, how would you manage them? So, asymptomatic gallstones, well, potentially uh, lifestyle modifications with you know such things as low-fat diet, if that is possible. Uh, High-risk populations. Uh, uh, so again, it's more to do with, uh, can, you know, can you maintain a relatively low fat diet? The, the talk I tend to have uh, for, you know, for patients with, a, with asymptomatic gallstones is that if you don't have symptoms, you probably do, do not need an operation. But symptomatic gallstones, well, uh, I tend to say to them that they have two choices. They can have a non-intervention approach, which effectively is a low fat diet, uh, keeping their weight down and seeing how they go. Most patients will say to you that they've already tried that. Well, then we say, well, we can offer you a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is removal of the gallbladder, uh, which is the common sort of modality of treating these patients. At last count, there were anything between 50 and 80,000 cholec uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomies done in the UK. And when we talk to these patients about this operation, uh, we do say to them that there is a risk that they could have it done open, especially if you put a camera in and say there's a lot of adhesions and uh, the gallbladder anatomy is difficult to delineate or that they have had major previous surgery on the abdomen such as multiple laparotomies which then shows you so many adhesions that you can't actually get into the, the right cavity uh, we would uh, we would end up doing it uh, via the open route. Uh, Non-operative management of acute cholecystitis this is something we're doing quite a lot of in the COVID-19 era so you would treat these patients with antibiotics. Uh, you could potentially put a drain called a cholecystostomy into the gallbladder wall, and we're doing this for our older population. This is purely designed to try and get these patients out of hospital where they could potentially get COVID uh, so, so that 
the inflammation settles down around the gallbladder. And we hope that in a couple of months' time, when things have settled down with regards to the, vi to the virus, we would get these patients back and, uh, and potentially operate on them. Uh, but uh, but you can you know you can use uh, uh, sort of antibiotics and drainage as a stopgap uh, to try and treat these patients non-operatively. Uh, potentially lithotripsy, uh, we've tried it in a couple of patients uh, in Southampton, uh, whereby you, we haven't been able to use the ERCP uh, 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 sort of modality to get it either stones impacted in the gallbladder neck uh, or uh, in the common bile duct. But in truth, if we're talking about standard management, uh, that is effectively laparoscopic cystectomy in symptomatic patients uh, and open uh, if there's a reason for it uh, and non-operative management if they are not particularly fit. NICE guidelines. Uh, so NICE uh, uh, is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. They release guidelines which are adopted across uh, all units in the country, effectively standardizing care and they state that uh, we should offer an ultrasound scan to diagnose gallstones, an MRCP, so this is an MRI scan of the biliary tree, uh, uh, plus an endoscopic ultrasound, uh, which is really not particularly need, you know, needed, but if, uh, if there's concern uh, that there are stones in the biliary tree, so if, if, the, if the patient has deranged LFTs or the biliary tree is dilated, uh, advise to, uh, our patients to avoid food and drink that triggers their symptoms, but like I said, most patients will get an aversion to foods that particularly set off their symptoms. Uh, and uh, re, re, uh, reassure asymptomatic patients. Uh, but generally, if you are symptomatic, we are offering you day case laparoscopic cholecystectomy in an elective setting. And that is gold standard of care in the UK. Uh, early, within a week, uh, for laparoscopic cholecystectomy for acute cholecystitis, there's a lot of literature saying that if you can actually operate on patients with acute cholecystitis quite soon within their index admission, then that would obviate the need for these patients to come back to hospital on multiple occasions with recurrent attacks of acute cholecystitis. So if we can, and most hospitals run what we would call is a hot gallbladder list. So you, you get a patient that comes in and within a couple of days of their index admission, they have their gallbladder taken out. Or you could do it... Um, uh, via drainage, like I've said, uh, uh, and you can, sorry, you can also do a late, a delayed cholecystectomy. So this is after six to eight weeks. So the patient is treated with antibiotics and then they're booked onto an elective list to have their gallbladder taken out. Like I mentioned before, uh, a percutaneous drain uh, only uh, if uh, surgery is contraindicated and generally to do with the patient's fitness uh, or the patient's fitness at the time. So if they're very unwell, uh, in ITU on organ support, then obviously doing an operation on them is not the right thing. So drainage and getting the patient better to fight another day would be the way to go. So in summary, incidence of gallstones is quite high in the general population. Most patients are asymptomatic. Uh, most common stones tend to be of the mixed variety or cholesterol related. Several risk factors as we've discussed. Common problems include biliary colic, cholecystitis, gallstone pancreatitis and cholangitis. Symptoms can be very wide ranging from right upper quadrant pain to fevers and rigors and of course organ failure. Uh, conservative management is with antibiotics, cholecystostomy, so of drainage, potentially an endoscopy and gold standard operative management for symptomatic patients with gallstone disease is to have their gallbladder taken out, which is a cholecystectomy. Thank you. Any questions, Giles? Uh, your your uh, your mic is on mute, Giles. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That little technical hitch there. Uh, thanks for a fantastic um, uh, presentation there, Arj. That was absolutely great. The uh, there's just a couple of things. There's a lot of questions uh, that um, Mike Silver in the background is answering on your behalf. But just uh, a couple of points. Um, how useful is ERCP? in the management of gallstone disease. Can you just explain exactly when you would use ERCP in the management of gallstone disease? Of course. People are getting a bit confused. The, the ERCP doesn't go into the gallbladder, obviously. No, uh, no, so, so, so that is, uh, so I should have made it quite clear. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, absolutely, so if stones have uh, transferred out of the gallbladder and are now sitting in the common bile duct, that is when we would use an ERCP. 
occasionally, if you have a very good endoscopist and you have a stone that is sitting, say, in the cystic duct, uh, they can potentially uh, help you in removing it. But mainly, I think what the students need to understand is an ERCP endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography is an intervention procedure used to remove stones uh, from the common bile duct. Excellent. Now, you mentioned um, uh, 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 towards the beginning gallstones in pregnancy, which you and I both sort of see in a not infrequent basis. Yes. What, let's just put it that it's, a, it's a, a, a lady presents, she is pregnant, she's 12, 15 weeks pregnant, she's got symptomatic gallstones, and those gallstones are small. Yes. What, what's your management with that, with that patient? And what are the risks of things like cholangitis and pancreatitis? How would you manage that lady? So uh, our general feeling uh, is that the vast majority of these patients uh, simply uh, are trying um, low-fat diet um, will, will make a difference to their symptoms. Uh, if they don't, then they're, you know, or if they then present acutely with very severe pain, and we've had a couple of those patients, uh, we do uh, we do operate on them. So, so we've had a, a couple of patients where uh, uh, we have uh, we have done a laparoscopic cholecystectomy whilst they have been pregnant. We have a very sort of considered discussion with them uh, on the risk of miscarriage. Uh, interestingly, it isn't as high as people think it is. It can be done quite safely. Uh, or if they already have stones in their common bile duct, then frequently uh, we will ask them to have a stent fitted, but without something called a sphincterotomy. Uh, uh, so uh, the main reason being that a sphincterotomy is where uh, the, uh, uh, the endoscopist uh, uh, gets up to the ampulla of the um, of vata. So this is the, uh, the opening where the, where the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct open into the duodenum. There's a sphincter there. And one of the ways of ensuring that um, you can have a successful ERCP, uh, but also that stones will then fall through if they form or, f or, or slip into the common bile duct at a later date, is to actually cut the sphincter to make it loose and lax. Now, that unfortunately is associated with uh, a risk of, of developing pancreatitis. So what we tend to do is we tend to ask our endoscopist to simply not do the sphincterotomy and just put a stent in for while the patient is pregnant. So she, she then has a successful pregnancy and then we will go out, you know, go on and take out her gallbladder and treat the stone, which might still be, you know, which might still be sitting there. Brilliant. I'm just gonna leave you with one final question, yeah. which is um, you take the gallbladder out for, for and you, she recovers well, but what are the long-term implications of having your gallbladder removed to the patient? What do you tell okay. them? So uh, that's a very common question, Giles. It's a very good question. Uh, we get asked that pretty much every time we tell someone that they need to have their gallbladder taken out. Interestingly, uh, in a vast majority of men, there's almost no symptoms whatsoever. There is a small proportion of patients, uh, and I'd say it's probably under 5%, who, because they lose the reservoir of bile, uh, you know, the job of the gallbladder is to store bile, which is made in the liver, and then the, bile, uh, then the gallbladder will squeeze down and push bile out when it's required which is mainly when you eat fatty food. Now, what happens is that the liver effectively takes over that process. And uh, in the initial stages, in some patients, there's generally a steady trickle of bile coming down the common bile duct into the gut. So a small proportion of patients will complain of slightly loose stools, which mostly uh, will get better within six to eight weeks of the operation. But undoubtedly, there are a small proportion of patients that where these symptoms are troublesome. Vast majority, 95% of the time, you won't even know that it's been removed. Arj, if you could just put on to the final slide, if that's okay. Right. Oh, yes, of course. Um, this is, I'd just like to say a big thank you again. I'd also like to thank the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh for putting these uh, lectures on and to Mike Silver for the huge amount of work that uh, he's, he's put in to organise this. Please, 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 everyone sign up to the Managing Acute Limb Ischemia. It's a fantastic speaker. Um, I've heard him speak several times and, uh, and he's really, really good. So uh, I hope to see you all um, on the 21st of April. And if not, then I definitely expect to see you all in, uh, at the next Thursday for the dysphagia lecture. Thank you all. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.